And welcome to another episode of the Airgun Geeks podcast, where today we're talking about the LCS SK19 Semi-Auto in 25. Today we have special guests, Robert Buchanan, one of the owners of Airguns of Arizona and Precision Airguns Distribution. We have Steve Shally from AEAC, and we also have Bill from Target Forge, also my co-host for tonight. How y'all doing? How we're doing? Doing well. Thank Good. you for having me. I appreciate it. Me too. Happy to be oh, here. No problem. Awesome, 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 awesome. This is, I'm so excited. I don't even know what to say. All right. First off, how's we'll everyone's doing good? That's good to see. Robert, I know you've been traveling all over the country. Did you get, get your legs stretched and all that? Yeah, well, you know, uh, lately I've been uh, going around helping to uh, set up a series of uh, Grand Prix events for uh, Extreme Field Target, EFT. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of been, uh, you know, where my destinations have been. You know, we've been to uh, to Texas with with Ron. Uh, I haven't been to Oregon, but uh, I've got my uh, I've got my main man on the road with the van, Larry Piercy. He's he, he's been there to support that match it re- real well um, here in Phoenix uh, at the Phoenix uh, Rod and Gun. Uh, we do a Grand Prix event there by uh, uh, Ben Spencer kind of uh, sets up and that's his domain. So uh, that's been a lot of my work. We've got another one going on here fairly soon. Let's see, Ron's and the tech stream is going on, uh, I think, next weekend. Not this weekend, of course, but uh, the weekend after. And then we've got one going on up in uh, Utah. Uh, with uh, David uh, Stevenson is the match director there. I think that's in August. So that's been a lot of our a lot of our work is uh, getting that started to uh, kind of promote the EBR EFT as the culmination of uh, those Grand Prix events. And we'll have a, a Grand Prix for the year winner EFT champion and also a, a EBR EFT champion. So they may be the same person. They may not. Just depends on you know, if they've traveled and, and uh, earned points with their uh, with how well they shot and uh, attendance of the event. So I, I'm really excited about that. That's uh, a lot of fun. I think a lot of people are kind of enthused that that's going on. And, um, you know, that's kind of where, uh, where I've been, along with a lot of product testing. There's a lot of new products that are right around the corner for us. Uh, you know, I've talked to Steve here recently, and so we've got some bombs to release over the next three and four months in the industry. So... Uh, you know, we've, I've been uh, working very hard at uh, proofing those and helping the uh, the pre-production, you know, prototype work and all of those things that uh, we're pretty jacked up about. That's exciting. So. Yeah, a lot of people <laughs> don't don't realize behind the scenes. You know, you look at a company like Air Guns of Arizona or Precision Air Gun Distribution, how much of their efforting actually shapes the final product, whether it's a day state, a brocock and LCS Air Arms or whatever it else is that, you know, they've got their hand in, you know, the, um, <clears throat> the production of, and yeah. uh, I just, it's, it's, it's always been a fascination to me learning that how hard you guys work every day to well, evolve those that. products to what they are before the public gets them. Well, I think the public thinks we just buy a gun and sell it. You know, right. don't. Oh, <laughs> no, there's something new right now. <laughs> you know, the, those days, those days are long gone. You know, it was uh, it, it was it was a little bit more that way years ago. Whenever we were first into the industry, but if you want to be successful and if you want to have enough, you know, have enough uh, to be honest profits to be able to support and run a company and grow a company and to support and grow products and make new products, you know, those things don't come out of thin air. You know, it takes a lot of hard work. And uh, we've become much, much closer to our manufacturers uh, in terms of trying to make sure that the products that, uh, that we carry uh, benefit the marketplace and appeal to the marketplace. Yeah. And, uh, and we're always striving to be the absolute best. I, you know, <laughs> people say, you know, competition is, is, a, is a great thing. And it is, you know, it keeps you moving. My idea is to, uh, you know, to make the competition really squirm. So... That's what we try and do is, you know, always bring to market things that uh, are uh, very, very desirable 
very fair in terms of cost. You know, value for money is very important. Uh, you know, you've got folks like uh, like Steve here that's a you know integral part of you know bringing those things to market and showing them off. Uh, Bill, the same thing. You know, he's got uh, a line of his targets that uh, that he's trying to constantly improve and to make better and to make more unique and interesting. You know, uh, you, you don't get to sit down and sleep much, really. No, and that's just the way. No, it's it's we have very specific needs here in the U.S. And one thing I learned is that, you know like a precision air gun distribution, their manufacturing partners, you know, overseas, they may not know our needs. And so it's, you know, it's companies like Air Guns of Arizona that kind of relay that from the ground level so that ultimately the manufacturers can build a product that the customer says yes to, like this, like this um, SK-19 semi-automatic, which is yeah. launching 30, 34 grain pellets at 55 to 65 foot pounds of energy, 19 in a mag as fast as you want them. Um, you know, it made an incredible pesting gun. It's just you know. a lot of fun. You know, people like to have fun when they shoot too. You know, we're mm -hmm. we're always looking, to, trying to make the most accurate, most powerful gun that we can. You know, that's that appeals to people with the right weight and all the rest. But the the LCS is is very unique in that it, it it's very accurate, as I think you you found, uh, and it's, it's got fantastic power. But it's just so much fun too. You know, just to go out and shoot, it's kind of like an adult version of a BB gun, you know, really. <laughs> it, it's, it's you know, shooting 10 cans at 100 yards as fast as you can pull the trigger as opposed to shooting 10 cans at 10 yards. You know, yeah. I, that's the kind of way that I, 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 and it's a serious gun too. I don't mean to take that away from it, but it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. So, so, so my question, Robert, you know, because I've never, I've, I've heard of LCS Air Arms and everyone gets them confused with Air Arms. It's like, no, 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 no. So research in this and, and knowing your standards, where do these come from and why did you choose to put your name behind it to be well, a retailer for us it? Initially. Okay. Um, the, um, the product is, uh, LCS is out of uh, North Carolina. Okay. Uh, they uh, they assemble component parts. They're an assembly plant, really. They assemble component parts that get that, that they receive. Those component parts. Some are made in Asia. Some are made in Germany. Some are made in uh, in Korea uh, and and other places. So th they bring those in, like much like other manufacturers. Most manufacturers today, and I don't want to name names because I don't know if they'd want me to. You know, bring in component parts and and assemble the guns and test and and that's how they do it to keep the cost reasonable. If the LCS mm -hmm. was 100% made in the U.S., nobody could or would afford it. It would just be, it would be, I think, a four or five thousand dollar air rifle. It uh, reminds it, me a lot it, of how the auto manufacturers do it, where you read the window sticker now, <laughs> where it'll say like foreign parts content, you know, X amount here, X amount there, but assembled in the United States. It kind of mm -hmm. reminds me a lot it's, of how the auto industry the does it, how, th how this brand does it. We're in a global market, you know. Uh, that's why the uh, pandemic has been so brutal to the world economy is because, you know, we sell stuff to company A that's in, you know, country B, and, and they sell stuff to us, you know, and, and everything gets shut, shut down, you know, or, or slowed down. So uh, LCS came the representatives of LCS came to us uh, I don't know three three years ago now maybe maybe four I can't remember exactly and uh, they contacted one of the gentlemen that used to work for me uh, who actually is one of the promoters of element optics that you know your shirt that you've got on there uh, mm -hmm. his name was Shane Keller he had a pretty decent relationship with with the people that you know they called and, and they, he was the first point of contact and they set up an appointment to come to show the product off at our store, which they did very, very early on. And of course, you know, my I'm always very skeptical, really. You know, my first response is, you know, here's another air gun, great. Something else to have to stock and put on the <laughs> shelf and spend money on, you know. Uh, but it was very impressive, and most of the guys uh, really thought it was, like I said, it was fun. A lot of the air guns are fun, but this was like a full automatic gun that shoots this kind of power and this kind of accuracy, and I don't need a license. That's a big deal. So uh, 
Oh, select fire, you know, semi and full. And then, Steve, you just did the semi-auto. I want to make sure we clarify that. Yeah, um, and to kind of piggyback off Robert a little bit, LCS approached me shortly after they approached Robert, and um, and they wanted me to be, to be a part of what they were doing. And I wasn't, you know, full disclosure, I wasn't really comfortable at the time because I, I, I have mixed feelings about the fully automatic piece component, you know, when it comes to air guns. But um, but when they developed the semi-automatic version, you know, I thought to myself, now that's something that I really feel, felt a strong need to share with my audience because at that point it becomes a very useful, purposeful tool, mm -hmm. you know, for hunting or pesting. You know, I don't I don't think a lot of people are going to spend. What was it, Robert? About twenty three hundred bucks? Is that what yeah, they cost? It, what is it? Twenty twenty two. Depends on 30 cal. The 30 cal is a little bit more money than the 22 and the 25 calibers. I don't remember exactly, but that's close enough. Yeah, around there. So when I saw all those elements come together with the regulator, which is, you know, externally adjustable, a hammer spring, which is an externally adjustable, a Lothar Walther polygonal barrel, you know, mm -hmm. all combined with that semi-automatic and a 19 round magazine in the, in the, um, in a hammerless valve system, I said, you know what? That's really interesting. I think air gunners will really appreciate that. And I kind of was like, hey, you know, you still feel like doing something on a EAC. It was time for you to get on. It was time for you to make uh, make a presentation. Yeah. And so I'm I'm kind of in the middle of that now. So if you guys have for those of the, those of you that are watching on YouTube or listening on the Air Gun Geeks podcast um, on YouTube's AEAC Home, the Air Gun Exploration and Advancement Channel. You'll see a full review coming on this gun, as well as um, as a really good time hunting iguanas down in the Fort mm -hmm. Myers, Miami area, which I just came off of a three-day hunt. I don't want to call it a hunt. It's more of a an invasive species eradication event. I think is probably mm -hmm. what it's what it, what it really is. The great and, call. Uh, yeah, it, it looks like things were thick. They were thick. Sometimes it was like as fast as you could pull the trigger. It's it, you know at times. Wow. Yeah, but uh, that's crazy. anyway, to kind of get back and kind of bring home your first question about LCS. So uh, they came to us. Uh, we showed a limited interest. The gun wasn't really ready yet. Uh, and uh, then we, whenever it became closer to being, you know, kind of in full production, uh, we had always, we, we would always been their, their first point of contact. We, we were the, they chose us to be the company that sold the gun. And uh, you know we were happy to uh, we were happy to do that. Uh, you know there's some there's some roads that we could take that I don't think we need to take. You know about how and all it came to pass and and all the rest. And if people want to you know find out that information, they can always ask me personally. But uh, at the end of the day, they came to us. Uh, we you know we were happy to uh, to invest the time and the money. It was a Big expenditure in cash uh, because uh, you have to uh, buy these things in advance and pay for them in advance uh, to get them coming. It's not like they send them to you and then you you know then you write a check for the invoice. That's not how it is. So it's it, it's been a big investment for uh, for the company to uh, to make it happen, but it's paid dividends. I, we 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 have a lot of a lot of happy customers. They're, they're, like I said, they're so unique and so much fun. Oh, uh, especially, uh, most of, I don't know if I can say most because I really don't know the exact numbers. The guys could tell you a little bit with better clarity and accuracy. But a lot of the LCS guns sold are the first time people buying an air gun because they're not interested in buying a gun that goes clickety click, you know, and the precision that we love as air gunners, you know, bringing a side lever back and hearing the thing click into place and then moving the bolt forward and concentrating on a target and pulling the trigger, uh, that doesn't necessarily appeal to a lot of firearm shooters. You know, they, they get that itch scratched with their uh, powder burners, okay? But this is like, wow, I now have an itch that I didn't know I had, and it's having something like that that I can shoot a full, you know, full mag in no time. It, it is it is very um, coming, you know, being a guy that shoots powder burners, AKs, ARs, shotguns, sidearms, you know, being ex-law enforcement. It was a, it, the SK-19 is a very familiar shoot 
um, to Robert's mm -hmm. point, and it, it actually has a firing cycle that feels a lot like my AKs. You know the, how the AK. You, well, you know, made that mention of that. Uh, in Does that the, mean really well. slow? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's almost you know you shoot an AK and you can feel that one pound, you know, reciprocating mass. It's almost like yeah. a locomotive. It's like clack 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 yeah. clack. Mm -hmm. It has that really unique feel to it. Like the, a stin you, gun almost, or Stein gun, or whatever. I don't know how to you know I don't know the proper uh, pronunciation of it, but you can you know there's definitely a da, 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 you know. Um, it, it, mechanism yeah for me it was a it's a very definitive like clack, clack each time you shoot it and it's a, it's a very satisfactory fulfilling tactile yeah. experience and it was just very familiar to robert's point which i can see why the powder burner guys would like it mm -hmm. you know there's you don't cock anything ever you just fill it with air and you fill the magazine and you turn off the safeties and and you start shooting and we, so we, um we had the uh one of the representatives of probably the largest archery company in the United States. And I won't mention the names because like I said, I, I didn't get permission to mention the name and I wouldn't know if the owner would or wouldn't mind. So, uh, but he, uh, one of his sales reps came into the store and never bought an air gun before he was driving by one day, the store and he said, I heard, I'm going to check that out. So he pulled in and he, you know, kind of was in, you know, wonderland of all the different products. And he ended up, First air gun was an LCS, called the owner of the company. And uh, I think they bought two or three or four of them at the end of the day, you know. Mm. So that was they, a good day. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have a lot of good days like that. But mm -hmm. but um, it just appeals to a, a, a real wide range of, of, of customers because mm. of how, how unique it is. I think it's the airsoft guys are going to like yeah. it, too. I feel it mm -hmm. has that airsoft gun feel as well. Well, but that, out of, yeah, out of that sport. yeah, kind of cheap. Airsoft to me means cheap, you know, and it's not cheap. It's not cheap to buy and it's not cheaply made. So when I hear airsoft, I always go to think toy in Walmart. No, I wasn't thinking yeah. that at all. It just has that firing cycle that's very reminiscent of that. I mean, it's a nine pound, 14 ounce deal scoped and with a silencer on it yeah. filled with air and lead. So it's, it's no, it's no airsoft gun. Have but, you ever uh, fired one, Bill? Or, uh, I have not, and I knew of the automatic one first, and I was like, because ah. I have a varmint business called Varmint Guru, and that's why I bought a Leshy. It's a quick follow-up when walking around the ponds and whatnot, and then when I heard Steve was reviewing the semi-auto, I'm like, hmm, and that's why I'm excited for the video to come out, because, you know, I want to go honey iguanas, and, you know, I'm chasing muskrats and rabbits and all types of stuff, and quick follow-up shots is it's simplistic versus running around with, you know, any type of side cocker or whatever. Cause now I'm, you know, I'm left-handed, so I'm generally okay, but it, I'm excited. Yeah. Robert, and I, I got to see one, uh, when I was at PAE with you, the Pacific air gun expo, mm -hmm. uh, you were up there with, uh, with the LCS crew and, uh, I, I got to see it there for the first time. I've not shot it. Uh, and one day I would like to, um, but I, I think what I'm curious about is what, you know, th these are obviously complex devices. I mean, there's a lot of parts in there. A lot of things have to happen at just the right time. Um, what type of warranty do they offer on those guns? And is that service done by your exceptionally talented team at Air Guns of Arizona or do they go back to no, it, it, we, we, we service the guns and we do all the warranty repair uh, for three years. Mm -hmm. Now, oh. that that does not include, you know, if a, if a guy jams a barrel full because he wasn't paying attention. <laughs> you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't cover a, a abuse or neglect, you know, but uh, for the, you know, for the operation and the, and the, um, you know, the, the rifle working as it's supposed to, then that's, uh, it's, uh, a three-year stint for the gun. It's a good warranty in the air gun industry. Yeah, yeah it is. Mm -hmm. It says a lot. It yep. is. And uh, I can tell you, uh, the company is, I'm, I'm very proud of our service department. It's it's a massive part of the company. I don't, I don't think uh, most people understand how, you know, how, 
how effective you have to be and organized to import guns and to do the warranty repair and service and stock the stock the parts and you know and and be a, a good partner for the for the manufacturer you know the manufacturer is looking for a good partner and that that's it, it's difficult to do you know and, but I think we do a, a spectacular job I can't say enough for uh, for the guys in the service department uh, it's a it's a full time job for what one two three four five six guys I think we have um, and uh, you know they're they're constantly you know taking care of customers uh, needs and if there's a warranty issue great if it's a service issue or a tune you know I, I one of the things I don't think people maybe the industry doesn't understand is we do massive amounts of air gun tuning you know we don't we don't um, advertise that we are tuner so to speak you know a lot of guys that's how they make their living is to advertise and talk about that they you know send me your gun and I'll tune it for you but mm -hmm. you know my, my guys are equal to or superior to any of them you know and a lot of the a lot of the time they're they're giving advice to the guys that uh, that are advertised tuners uh, we've, we've got enough work as it is but uh, they're they're very very good and they know what they're doing and we have uh, we have outside folks that also help us you know uh, the uh, the Day State brand we have, uh, which I know this is not the topic of this conversation, but we have a, you know, a, a whole team that is uh, dedicated to um, improving the product and doing the things necessary to put it at the top of the competitive mm -hmm. uh, competitive line. Yeah, I can certainly uh, echo your sentiments there, Robert. I have experienced your sales, uh, not your sales, your support organization and I have nothing but praise for them and uh, and I thank you for their assistance and for you actually helping me uh, get them engaged it was it was really helpful thank well you. you know you're welcome and I you know appreciate it um, those those kind words you know it means a lot the the uh, you know the repair staff you're only as good as your as your repair staff you know if you sell X amount of guns let's just pick a number for just for a number, right? Say you sell a hundred guns uh, per month of a particular brand, you're going to have, you know, they're PCPs, they leak. I don't care if it's a five dollar PCP or a five thousand dollar PCP, mm -hmm. it will. You're leak. preaching to the choir. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it just will. You know, they're they're very they're very high tech. There's a lot of sealing surfaces. So the chance of an O-ring or something getting nicked at, on assembly, it, it, just, it just happens. No one likes it, no one wants it, but it happens. So, you know, if you, if you sell 100 of, of, of a particular model, you're going to have it anywhere from a 4% to 10% uh, rate of, uh, of failure or issues, okay? So, you know, let's, so that's, that, that could be four to 10 guns uh, per month of that one model of gun. Okay, that one model of gun. And then you do that the next month, that's another four to ten. And the next month after that, that's another four to ten. So, so it, unless you are prepared to see 20 to 30 boxes a day come back to your facility for issues, you know, you might want to think twice about getting into the ergon industry because, you know, that's mm -hmm. part of, that's part of the price you pay. Absolutely. And, and what you expect yeah. is the Bell, I, so. Oh, sorry. Sorry, oh, go ahead, didn't, didn't but Bill, I wanted to um, kind of touch on what you were asking about the warranty. You know, as a YouTube, as a reviewer for the industry, it, it's not my job to break stuff, but I definitely like to try to push the limits of the product to see, um, you know, how 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 much I can get away with. And I will say, mm -hmm. in, in with the SK19 being a semi-automatic and being a 55 to 65 foot-pound deal, maybe even more. I was very curious to see, you know, how it, how well it would run, you know, before I had a malfunction or before, to Robert's point, loaded up the barrel with three or four pellets, you know, at the same time. And, and, and before I even took it down to Miami to go hunting with it, I had over a thousand rounds in it, um, not only tuning it, but, um, but also testing all the JSB variants, all the H&N Barracuda variants. Uh, the Zan slugs, the JSB slugs, the H&N slugs, the FX hybrid slugs. You know, I wanted to see in all different weights, I wanted to see if there was anything I could do to trip up 
that um, that hammerless mm. uh, valve mechanism, semi-automatic mechanism in the gun. And I'm happy to report I haven't had a single failure mm. wow. um, prior to the hunting trip, on the hunting trip, at which we took a lot of iguanas. It's like 28 or 30 the first day and another 25 the second day. And, and I had my fair share of misses in there. We were out in 101 <laughs> degree heat and Ooh. and – and I just, the thing just would not mess up. Most, Steve, most of the uh, issues that we see with that gun are owner caused, for lack of a better term. You know, they, they turn the regulator up. People, you know, people are always searching and playing and doing what they want to do. And I, you know, the factory says I can get X amount of power. I bet I can get more. You, you sure. know, so they crank the regulator up way beyond where it was designed to operate, or they crank the hammer. You know, the, 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 we call it a throttle, you know, at the bottom there. They crank the throttle up. It's almost like I, a water spigot is the best way I could describe it's, it's, how it's it felt rack. tuning yeah, it. Yeah, it is. Uh, pretty much, yeah. Good, yeah. good, uh, good observation. But they, uh, you know, they try and ask the gun to do what it wasn't designed to do. Sure. Or, or they just want to see what the limit is for fun. And then, you know, they, you know, when the regulator said it may be 200 bar and they only have 210 bar in the gun, you know, it's not going to run. You know, you're not going to get any shots. You're not going to get any performance. So, you know, those are the things that we see. Uh, we, we do get uh, issues occasionally with it, but it's generally almost always owner-caused or user-inflicted, you know. I believe that. I actually went – I don't know, Bill and Patrick, if you guys – I know you've got questions prepared for the audience on the SK-19. We've probably barely scratched the surface of that. But if you have tuning questions – I have familiarized myself with the gun. Um, I, I actually detuned it for my needs um, because I, I wasn't getting the accuracy that I wanted. But ultimately, I, I got pretty close, and I feel like if I had detuned it even further, then you know there was how I received it. There's how the owner's manual recommended it be set up, and mm -hmm. and then there's kind of where I went with it or wanted to go with it. Um, I'm prepared to to uh, answer your questions or walk the audience through uh, through that as well because I, I think I've learned. I feel like I've learned what it is that that gun wants to be a real, um, a real laser beam. Well, and everyone's a little different, just like every other, all the other brands, right? Yep, for sure. It's yeah. definitely the barrel lottery. It's got a, like, it's got a Lothar Walther polygonal in it. That barrel should like the, um, you know, the JSB 34 grain variants, and it did. Mm -hmm. but Probably the Mark One's better than the Mark Twos. I bet you. I actually had better luck without the Mark Ones, which is funny because that just speaks to the barrel lottery. They get yeah. like the regular JSB 34 grain best, uh, but I, um, you know, it came out of. I don't want to get into this unless you guys wanted to actually ask about it, but came out of the box shooting a 936 average, so with that pellet, so I was getting some instability. I wound mm -hmm. up um, once I got the speed from the 936 average that it came out of the box to the 900 average that the mm -hmm. owner's 903 average that the owner's manual recommended most of that corkscrewing went away mm -hmm. and i feel like if i had either backed that off even further maybe to 885 or maybe a 915 i could have completely eliminated it you know and made a, a really good 50 yard gun a 100 yard gun but um well and you can adjust the reg pressure and things you probably didn't have the time nor the uh or the desire maybe even to go that deep into it. But, uh, you know, you, you, could, you could have probably played around with that. that would make a difference oh, I did quite a bit. Uh, and I can share all those findings with you guys later on if you want, if you have questions on tuning. But um, I also tuned the heck out of it with the zero dB moderator. There's a segment I did on Instagram where I had three or four different zero dBs, and I, and I set the gun up to shoot at 50 yards. And I went through each of the zero dB moderators and instead of like a, a harmonic barrel tuner, I actually tuned the frequency of the gun to where I got it shooting like three eighths inch groups at 50 yards with uh, the zero dB moderator. So I actually wound up using that as a tuning tool to further mm -hmm. hone the tune that I had put on the gun. And I had quite a few hours. I had like two full days in tuning it because it, it doesn't tune like any other air gun you've ever tuned before. You've got a regulator pressure setting. And then you've got, you know, I think what Robert, we were calling like a, a spigot or Robert had another word for it, but the, the throttle, the throttle, it's like a throttle. You're, you, it feels like you're controlling like a, like an aperture and it does have an influence on what the valve does 
where you can feel it like loading up the valve to make it work to kind of get the results you want, tightening up those ESs and SDs. It, it was an interesting learning learning experience for sure. It, and it, I have all my settings if you guys want them later in the program if you wind up going down that path. To well, share that's with a great well, we're going to quiz you, Steve. We're going we're gonna <laughs> to definitely put that on the test. Yeah, I think, that's I, I think those... Steve got all my questions. <laughs> I'm like, yes, uh, tuning great. Yes, I, I've seen where they've, where um, Chris from Up North Air Gunner has tone tuned, like you were doing with the zero dBs, and yeah. how that affected things. Like, that's a very high pitch. This is a lower pitch kind of sound. And what are you looking for? And, and all of that. So, yeah, I mean, tuning is, is a big part of the questions that I had because it seems to be very easy to tune. Is it, it toolless? It it was easy from the in the in the from the standpoint that the regulator and I want to keep calling it a hammer spring, but it's not. Oh. The two the two adjustments on it are both externally accessible. Okay. Very very very, very and they're both knobs to turn. Oh, so no tools. It's, no, it's toolless. Hundred oh. oh, percent. That's cool. Yeah yeah yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, there's actually like a um, <clears throat> the regulator adjustments on the front over the bottle, and it's on the outside. And it has like a little hole in the side of the knob where I was sticking like a, a pin to sort of turn it, and it's click, it click, it turns to click. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, it's it's a toolless deal, and but it just behaves nothing like. But um, that's that's cool. Like a regular tune, it took like two days to figure it out. Yeah, I've been staring at your Instagram, and the fact, uh, and that was going to be one of my questions, is does it click or was it smooth? Because clicking, you can count and then go back. To where you were originally at? Yeah, they and both so forth and so on. Yeah, I had note. I had a notepad where I was, you know, I, I I recorded where I was originally. It has a manometer and a pressure gauge where you can see where you, where you're at on the reg. The owner's manual suggests a regulator area and, and and some of these other things, and it tells you where you want to be on velocity with a 25 grain and a 34 grain, which I tuned the gun to that because this wasn't per se an AEAC tuning guide video. You know, mm -hmm. that wasn't asked of me on this one, but I wanted to have a successful hunt. I didn't want to drive mm. four and a half hours down to Miami and be missing iguanas at 50 yards. And, and it's a good thing I did because one of the things that I learned that I didn't know about harvesting iguanas is you get within 55 or 60 yards of them and they're off. You know, it's not like, you know, if you go to Jessica's YouTube channel, uh, uh, um, Iguana Solutions, Mm -hmm. It's not like, you know, she's shooting all her iguanas 20 feet up in trees. Like, she'll tree them, and then she'll get in there with her Brokaw Atomic and plunk, oh, plunk, 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 and they're falling <laughs> down like like <laughs> giant avocados, you know, out of the trees. Yeah. Oh, it, it wasn't that. Like, I wanted to capture really good scope cam video for the audience, so we were like, you know, bipod, back of the truck, you know, sneaking up on these iguanas out in the grass, just... You Once know, again, eating away, and no, you get in you know, iguanas and eliminating iguanas in a way, weren't you? I mean, you shot a lot, but I mean, we shot a lot. Yeah, Robert. To Robert's point, it was difficult because you get with it's that was like the magic number, like 50 yards. You broke that that like red line, tripping a laser beam. They were like, and they'd start looking <laughs> at you, and their little dewlaps would start going, and they'd start like this, and. If one of them oh, took bumps. off, the whole herd would take off. So we had either two options. They were really an interesting species where if you downed one in the cluster, it, like if you got lucky, a headshot, and just poom, toppled them right over, and you just lay, the rest would just stick around. And you could just ploom, 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 ploom. That was a really cool component of being able to, you know, film with That's the SK-18. It, like, it was like playing a video game almost. But if if you tagged that first one and he was like boom and he went and ran off, the other ones would run off after him. So it was a very difficult type of deal because you know they're reptiles too. You can get a heart and lung shot at 50 yards with a 55, 60 foot pound gun, and they're gonna run. They're gonna zombie up on you and boom and they're gonna be gone and the rest of them. Are yep. So you're trying to hit like this half inch target at like oh, so dying. Yeah. Yeah. right at the base of the skull to light light them out. So that the rest of them will just kind of sit there and you can kind of pick it was very challenging very fun it's funny yeah. that you say that steve because ted ted of ted's holdover talked about the order that you shoot certain birds mm. in darlings life cycle mattered mm -hmm. to whether or not you're going to get a follow-up shot interesting course, from an animal behavior standpoint both of these creatures come from the same origin 
The mm. iguana and and birds are are you know they oh, share yeah, a right. lot of similarity. They both came from the same point in the time. The dinosaurs, ever the dress. Yes, exactly. The dinosaurs, exactly. Yeah. My yeah. wife has a huge flock of chickens here, and we call them baby uh, baby dinosaurs because they they act like you would expect a dinosaur to act. Um, but yeah, it's it's interesting that you said that. And you kicked another rock loose in this broken mind of mine. And uh, I, you said that that you were messing with the regulator. Is that regulator um, adjustable, positive and negative, with air on it? No. Well, it it it's, it works kind of like how you would expect, like a Huma to work, or the or or like a a previous generation uh, FX regulator, you know that kind of thing, where mm -hmm. you can you can increase pressure to your heart's delight, but if you want to decrease pressure, you unscrew the bottle, and then okay. you dry fire the gun. One to two times. You don't want to over dry fire it because right. you don't want it to, you don't want that that hammer going when there's not an air cushion in there. But if right. you just dry fire it one or two times, it'll dump all its air out of its reservoir, and then you can back that back that. Um, so you're just bringing that pressure that's in front of the regulator down a little bit, so that you can come back up again and and adjust upward. You're you're trying yeah. to always adjust. Yeah, that. I brought it down a lot a bit. I mean, I, I I ran with it. You know, it was up around 145 bar when I got it. Mm -hmm. I wasn't happy with the ES. I think the ES was 36 feet per second, and I had like an 8 SD shooting that 930 uh, uh, 930 something average with that 34 grain. I wanted to try to shrink that because I knew that was going to be important trying to reach out 50 or 60 yards mm -hmm. on these things. And I was able actually able to to do that by running. A lower regulator pressure. I, I had success at 130 to like 131 and 138 were the two reg pressures I wound up making shot charts at. And the spigot that Robert makes reference to, the external adjuster on the valve, I was I actually slowly opened that. I wound up seven clicks more open than OEM. And what that seemed to do is put pressure. Uh, it kind of like loaded up that valve where I was able to shrink those ESs and SDs down to like a 25 ES and like a 6 SD over like 55, 60 shots mm -hmm. at 55 foot pounds, which even for what we do, we were doing was way, way overpowered. Like I didn't know the circumstances in which we were going to be harvesting. And when Jessica's like, yeah, you know, we're going to this big public park in Broward County. You know, the county's like commissioned <laughs> us to save the burrowing owls in the park. And, um, and the, you know, the iguanas are there digging up their burrows and displacing their she nests. She got free labor out of you. Basically. Well, she did because she was getting paid. I won't disclose the amount, but the contract was like per iguana. And we took like 60 of them in 48 hours. Nice. And, dude, and we didn't even put a dent in it, man. That place is nope. just infested. But, but you're out there shooting with like, you know, basically a 22 rimfire you know, mm -hmm. power level of an air gun, and here comes some mama jogging around the corner pushing her baby stroller, and you're like, oh my God, what am I even <laughs> doing out here? Or you'll shoot and you'll, you know, we're, you know, you'll hear a ricochet, and you're like, oh my God. So if I ever go back to there, I'm going to want like a 20 foot pound, 22 deal, maybe 16, 18 grain max. Well, that's but why I she's running with the atomic. Really. Yeah, like that was, that was the perfect gun for what she does, because like I said, they chase most of them up trees and just plug them all in the trees, but that doesn't make for good, good Hollywood. No. You know, for YouTube, I wanted to get out so we could see that pellet travel, muzzle to mm -hmm. temple, you know, sort of thing. Mm. But um, it was kind of a good thing we did because, it's like I said, they wouldn't let you get, get within 55 yards of them, you know, until they'd start moving. on. And when they start moving, man, they're either to the tree or to the bushes or to the water or whatever. How much do they weigh, a big one, Steve? 15 pounds. Uh, 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 yeah, the um, most of what we shot were probably between, um, I would say, three and eight pounds. She had, we had one where Jess, I got this all on film. Jessica took off like a Steve Irwin man. Like I, we had the GoPro and she was plugging like this little one out of a palm tree above our heads. And I kid you not, this five footer, like 11, 12 pounds, comes launching out of the palm tree. So it was like a Peter Pan. It's like, Foo! and it goes, it! and this thing hits the ground, and I'm there at the GoPro, like, and then Jessica's <laughs> like, ah, oh! and so Jessica like puts down her gun. This iguana takes off like a, you know how they run on their back legs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
like this a frilled like, lizard. Puts its head up and just starts lizard. hauling ass on his back legs. <laughs> Tail is like a wheelie bar, you know. And it just and then and then Jessica's like, poof, she goes does a Steve Irwin, takes off after this thing, and I'm like, I don't even know what's happening right now, you know. And she chases <laughs> this thing like 50, 60 yards up into another palm tree. She goes shooting up into the palm tree, and I'm like. What is even going on right now? I mean, this thing hasn't even been shot. And I had I had read like online beforehand, you know, they have teeth like razor sharp and mm -hmm. they'll whip your eye out with their tail and their spines are like razor blades. She goes up this tree after this thing. She grabs it by the tail. And she's holding on the tail. She's going, help me, help me. And I'm like, what do you mean help you? What the heck? What do you want me to do? I'm just the camera guy from Tampa. You know, I ain't touching that thing. It's alive, you know, tail going. So long story short, I reached up there. I got the back leg. She's got the tail. You know, I got one hand on the little GoPro and we're like yanking this thing out of this tree. And, uh, and, and long story short, she fell out of the tree. I fell out of the tree. The 12 pound iguana fell out of the tree alive. And she's sitting on the ground just hugging this thing. And I'm like, you know, at the end, I'm like, why in the world would you go through all that trouble? And apparently <laughs> one of her stuff. friends, she, she loves does. It. She's insane for this iguana. Yeah. Uh, and she's got tons of footage of this kind of thing on her YouTube channel, Iguana Solutions. She's on Instagram, too. She has two Instagrams, Iguana Sol Solutions mm -hmm. and I think Iguana Sniper, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, you can get your fill of this girl, but she's she's amazing. But she wanted this iguana to feed like one of her neighbors or something. Yep. yep. So she like she taped it all up with up. electrical tape and and did so like did the she behind say the it? back. Hmm? Did she say it, Steve, when she got it? She say what? Got she iguana? Oh, she said that. So, <laughs> he, he, so I was trying to film, you know, for for Air Guns of Arizona and LCS. <laughs> And every time I would, you know, vaporize one of these things, you know, Jessica, to her credit, she, I wouldn't have been able to do this without her. I wasn't prepared. This is like, I, I'm not, you know, I'm a review guy. I'm not like a hunter YouTuber. So it was like this huge learning curve. And, um, but she, she was great. She's, she kind of held like the other camera. I was working the scope cam. And, um, but every time I would vaporize one of these things, she'd, she'd be on the other camera and she'd go, got you iguana <laughs> and i had like 10 clips with this got you iguana and we had to have like a little powwow i'm like you know we can't say that in every single one of them the audience is going to think we're weird you know so we eventually worked through she that doesn't, she doesn't care she doesn't care no she was she great care. she was super accommodating she really got like in the mindset of helping me produce this video that was outside of what you know she would normally produce and man she was amazing amazing she can shoot that little brocock too she oh, she could yeah. she's headshotting well, everything well you my nickname to. for her is, is miss annie oakley every time i talk about her i go you know jessica from iguana solutions you know miss annie oakley there it is <laughs> gotcha and she's still talking to you and i'm like how do you do that you know yeah. so she's very passionate <laughs> about what she does she's really into conservation and and try to mm -hmm. eradicate or trying to eradicate you know the iguana from south florida uh, it's a real problem down there. And I was really yeah. not even tuned into it because here in Tampa Bay. You guys just don't have a Tampa, Steve? 200 miles north, we got nothing. It's too, really? it's too cold here. Too cold here. Interesting. Our winters get yeah. too cold. And um, But, man, down there, they poop like a 20-pound dog. There's poop. You know, the poop like a uh, Canada goose? Mm -hmm. Same. All over the water slides in this park, all over the pool deck, all over the boat docks, all over the boat ramp, all over the walkways yep. and the running pathways. And, you know, and like I said, they were displacing the the native species of the Florida burrowing owl, which I'll, I also have some really good footage of that we'll put in the video. And um, and then the, the residents of South Florida have real issues with them because they they poop all on the pool decks and in the swimming pools. It'll kill your pool real quick. One Big poop, time. Dude, done. they're huge poops, and they eat all the vegetation, so the condo associations, yeah. the churches, the schools. Like, these are all the types of places that are contracting, you know, hotels, like marinas. Like, these are all the places where she's down there eradicating, you know, she's the species. Got a, a lot of work, doesn't she? It was endless. Like, she could barely find end. two half days yeah. to spend with me. Her phone was going like crazy, like, I'll be there tomorrow. Sorry I'm late. And it was just insane. Like she was taking calls like, like hourly throughout our time together. Yeah.
I watched a Zoom call where it was the Florida State Wildlife. And they had the sheriff and everyone, and they said they're expecting about 50 million iguanas by 2025. It's amazing. They it's, breed it's like, uh, like, like, uh, they're, they're just well, they used to breed like, day. yeah, they used to breed once a year. Now they're doing it two to three times. So, and then you got the green iguana you're going after. You got the Mexican spiny tail, and now there's a hybrid, and now there's African Nile monitors in the in the canals, and yep. you have the tagu. We yeah. won't even talk about the anacondas that they found down there now. So that's <laughs> it, a whole it's other. A, it's an interesting but, thing, and you know. Yeah. AEAC, you know, this is this this kind of partnership with Robert on this hunting deal where I'm going to try to merge review and hunting together. This is a new direction for me, and I'm oh, going to try well, to do it with every gun that I touch because it's just such a relevant thing to life yeah. in Flo Florida, and it and it seems to be really meaningful to air gunners too. And the SK-19 was just such a great product to be able to kick that off with. I bet. So, because like I said, you're bing, bing, bing. I had several like twofers and double taps and yeah, you know, and the reptiles, they're not birds. They'll, Those they can hold their breaths. matter in a situation like that, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. a semi-auto has its place to where nothing else can come close. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It, and they hold their breath for 45 minutes underwater. So it's like I said, you can heart lung them and they'll run 100 yards. No problem. They take all their mm -hmm. little buddies with them. So there was a lot of pressure to, you know, with those headshots and so i was really glad i moderator tuned it because at 50 yards it changed a three-quarter inch group to three-eighths so unless so you're so a freak of gun. nature like tom adams on that bolt <laughs> what's that, that that's unless you're a freak of nature like tom adams on that bolt your your follow-up yeah. shot you're not going to get it unless you've got a semi-automatic mm -hmm. uh, it was very it was very very useful i um i didn't know what to expect and and it was just very useful in that environment. <clears throat> I really came to appreciate, you know, it's it's a heavier deal. It's nine, like I said, nine pounds, 14 ounces, something like that scoped. You put a bipod on there, you know, you're 11 pounds, 11 and a half pounds ish. So it was a truck bed bipod type of venture. I wouldn't want to be freewheeling it too much, mm. but it just worked really, really well for that, that situation. Before so, we get back to the LCS gun, I just want to ask one more question. Mm -hmm. Um, and Steve, you're a lot closer to this, and Patrick, you you are probably closer to this as well. Um, do the people in in wildlife control really believe that eradication is possible, or are we just trying to control? Because I know, like here in California, where I'm at, I'm, I wage an enormous war against rats. And mm -hmm. you're you're never going to win. And people who think, well, I'm just going to get rid of all the rats. No, you're not. Because there's a whole cluster of them over there. There's another cluster over there. And they're gonna keep they're gonna keep coming. You can control them. You can well, definitely well, reduce their numbers. But eradication, we did that to the buffalo, but shooting a buffalo is a heck of a lot easier than than an iguana that's hiding in the woods uh, or I, a rat that's in the ground, you know. If I use the word eradication, I probably didn't pick the best word mm -hmm. i do feel in my heart of hearts that there's no way that anyone's even going to put a dent in this i think most of what it's about is you have um it's like i said you have a preschool you have mm. a church right you know you have a condo association and it's just like any other pet you know whether it's a or pest whether it's a termite you know mm. whether it's a rat whether it's whatever bats right. in your belfry I think that these are just legitimate people with legitimate challenges and oh, they absolutely. call on these companies absolutely. to just try to help. And I, I think it's a, anything they do is a very temporary solution, but it fills a niche and it, it answers a need. And do they have a natural predator? No. So, so that's the problem. Maybe and, like a hawk, maybe Patrick. So the, the gators will eat them, mm -hmm. but it, you know, overall, it's it's more to, to answer Bill's question. It's it's a control thing, so they're trying to control what's going on. You spray for bugs around your house. Well, once a month or twice a month, once you get it, the the, the population dwindled in that area. It's just a preventive thing. It's it's a uh, it's never going to go away. Yeah, it's they, like they you're not going to get many. rid of the mosquito. No, no, you just it ain't happening. You, in other words, you would uh, you you shoot <laughs> to keep it clean. Um, as far as predators, we're primarily their predator. 
alligators eat them, crocodiles eat them. Um, hawks, not so much. Vultures, if they're dead. But most of the time, no, because they and and we only if you watch, you can find the the Zoom call with uh, with the state of Florida. We're not even seeing all of them. They live underground. So you they do. They live in aquifers. burrows up in the trees. Mm-hmm. Well, you got all the aquifers and underwater water in Florida, and they're trans. They're go- they're saying they're traveling underground. Wow. They do. They yeah, run they through like the, uh, the 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 not irrigation, but like um, the conduits that mm-hmm. um, like that handle like the water draining, and then in the canals and anywhere they can find a hole. Like in that park, it was the Florida burrowing owl. Those are their main two places. They live as high up in the tree as they can get, or deep. In, in the ground as they can get and then they have these cycles where they come out and they're like cattle they eat grass yes they'll eat anything eat they're even turning they're omnivores now because they're actually they eat eggs they'll eat some meat things they'll eat primarily you know vegetation but snails but that's I just read the that green iguana. Snails. we're just talking about the green iguana you still have the mexican spiny tail mm-hmm. which is highly aggressive and will will bite they actually look like little dinosaurs but, uh, but yeah, we, we could have a whole podcast on iguanas. Yeah, but, we need to. We got to so, focus on the SK19. So, so, so yeah, go back tuning, to in, this. tuning in for this. I apologize. So, no, no, well, that's it's a great, great question. It's good. Was, great question. Because well, it shows a purpose for the gun, and and why. And personally, looking at hammerless, short of my my knowledge was the early LCS auto. Then you got the Blitz. And then the new Ed Gun Leshy 2 came out. And then now this is out. And it's always been gimmicky and not necessarily trustworthy. Mm-hmm. Is is it going to function? Uh, you know, kind of thing. But I, that I think the hammerless to... systems are more trustworthy than uh, the other semi-automatic systems that we've had, uh, you know, the experiences with. Yeah. But uh, I agree. Uh, unless, I couldn't break it. Unless, unless you build a semi-auto <laughs> to an extreme level of precision and durability um and that costs a lot of money you know like a recoiling system mm-hmm. uh, this kind of thing it, it, it costs money to do that in a way that uh that is robust you know uh we've uh, we've just not had to date good success with any other semi-auto other than the uh other than the lcs and um you know, we do sell the uh, the, the Leshy. I, I don't have a lot of experience with Leshy. We we sell them. They seem to be good. So you know, that system is m- maybe a lot like the LCS. I don't understand it as much. So, uh, but the LCS has been really, you know, kind of head mm-hmm. and shoulders above. Robert, how does it compare to the Hubin? Yeah, it's very oh, similar to, to the it. Hubin. Yeah, it's very similar to the Hubin. The Hubin is is my understanding. We used to sell Hubin years ago, but the Hubin wasn't nearly as consistent for us. You know, I, other people have other experiences, so you know, I don't want to step on any any toes. But the Hubin was was difficult to more difficult to keep running, um, and, and a lot of that was because of the you know the relationships of with the factory and getting component parts and communication and. You know, all those things that kind of speed up being able to uh, to service a product. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I've heard that. Yeah. So, so the I can't speak to it now, but our um, the LCS has has been much much better, and the relationship with the factory is much better, and and they're much more attentive to our immediate needs uh, to make sure we get people's guns up and running. You know, whenever we need uh, parts, O-ring seals, this kind of thing. Mm. So here's it's a important. question for you, Steve. Mm. Maintenance. Mm-hmm. What's the maintenance like? Is is it hard? I saw some pictures on Instagram. Your Instagram. How hard is it? To, like clean the barrel, lube it up, make sure you do your proper <laughs> stuff. So I'm gonna do a quick barrel cleaning video on this gun, okay? Because there's a. Uh, it's very easy to answer your question for two reasons. The first reason is. The Lothar Walther polygonals, they tend not to hold lead mm-hmm. unless you're like stupid with them, push them to like 930 feet per second, <laughs> 950, <laughs> whatever. You know, the lead just, just doesn't stick in there. Mm-hmm. And, and so a lot of people, when they get their, their polygonals in that 880, 890 range, they just leave, they never clean them like ever. Okay. 
you know, I know the RAWs, the rapid air weapons or rapid air works now, whichever it is, you know, that that's kind of like how they'd like to tune those guns. So from that standpoint, if you tune the gun in a good place, it's the it's next to nothing. But to answer your question very directly, you know, there's no bolt to open to pull mm-hmm. like a cleaning patch through or whatever. <clears throat> so what you have to do is there's just two two screws in the breech that you loosen and then um, you unscrew the shroud, which just slides off, and you just unscrew the barrel counterclockwise and mm. it threads right out. And then you've got this barrel and you can just clean it any way you want to. It's a very quick and easy thing. The key is when you put it back together and you thread the barrel back in, you thread it in t- until it lightly seats and then you back it out about a tenth turn, and then you then you lock those two bolts on mm. the side of the breech, That's which hold it in its place, and screw the shroud back on. And the reason that is, is that floating um, valve system, it has to seal with the barrel, you know, because the the pellet or slug is actually being launched through the magazine into the barrel and and out the muzzle. And there's two floating apparatuses. One, the magazine itself actually floats forward and backward and mm. seals up against the back of the barrel and then on the back side of the valve there's a floating like kind of a copper washer that that floats as well too and then when when that all gets pressurized with each shot they kind of whoop, they seal on their two ends <laughs> that yeah. seals the magazine and you know away goes away goes your lead so that that indexing of you know screwing in the barrel till it lightly touches back it out a tenth turn lock everything down test fire the gun dry fire it make sure that your magazine is rotating through that dry firing and then you're good to go if you back if you don't have the barrel backed in enough uh, or back you know screwed in enough uh, then you know you those sealing mechanisms may not be able to do their job and you your es and sd Mm. might not be what you want it to be and if you have it backed in too tight, the magazine's not going to be able to rotate an auto index like it does. So you go about a tenth turnout from seated, and I had really good results there. I had um, uh, 21 ES and a 6 SD at 61 foot pounds by 50 shots. I don't know how well you can see this. Let me put it right where my face is. There you go. Wow. That's very level. Wow. Yeah. Look at that. I just kind of, there, there it is. Yeah. And you know, for that kind of gun, for what it is, you know, to Robert's point, it's not meant to be a precision instrument. You know, I didn't even fiddle with it at 100 yards, and I wouldn't unless this was a tuning guide and I can bring the velocity down, 880, you know, something like that. But at 50, they will like shoot said, at 100. They'll shoot it. They'll shoot inch, inch and a quarter if tuned properly with the right pellet mass. I think I could get it there. It would just be it, a it matter would. of getting the velocity right. It, you know, for me. You know, for someone that wasn't wasn't able to moderate or tune, me putting the best tune on the gun, it's about a three. It was about a three quarter inch, fifty yard gun, like four or five times over. And I sam- sampled that. I showed. All, I'm going to show all the groups in the video. And then when I moderate or tuned it, I got two groups at that same tune at three eighths at fifty. And so I feel like if I was able to take that even a step further and retune down to eight eighty ish, eight ninety, because what I was seeing was one and five, two and six, I'd get that instability pellet where otherwise they're they're traveling nice and smooth. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I'm sure you could get it there, but that's just not what, you know, can't have a 45 hour video, video. something's got to give. <laughs> or 45 yeah, minutes. Now video. I got to make room in the closet so the wife don't find out. That I <laughs> yeah, because it's like it's for, for what I'm doing and, and big thing on the podcast is what's your purpose? You know, what are you doing with that? And me pesting, don't get me wrong, I'm an FX guy, but I'm a product. I like, I need it to do a specific job mm-hmm. and a quick follow up because I don't want anything to suffer. I want a quick, fast dispatch and then, and then move on. Especially if you're eating the animal, you don't want to destroy the meat. Right. You know? um, and I've, I'm very interested in this now. I'm like, hmm. So <laughs> you definitely got my eye. It's a neat, it's a neat deal. I think it can get there. Yeah. I just, you know, for the audience, I wouldn't want them to get this and have such huge expectations because I don't think it was Robert can like, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that the value proposition of the SK19 semi-automatic or fully automatic slash semi-automatic is to shoot MOA at 100 yards. <clears throat> I think out of the, I feel like out of the box for most people, 
it's going to be a three quarter inch 50 yard gun. And then if they take the time to tune it, then moderator tune it, mm-hmm. you, know, you can get that down to three eighths inch and then probably, you know, get your one inch, one inch and a half at a hundred yards. Well, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a rifle that appeals to 95% of the reasons why people buy an air rifle, mm-hmm. you know, uh, you know, the, we represent, you know, it's in your name, air gun geek, right? Uh, mm-hmm. We represent, you know, the, the geeks and the nerds and the dweebs of air gunning, you know, we're, we're, you know, really splitting hairs, but most, most buyers, that's not who they are. You know, they want to buy a, a rifle that uh, they can shoot in the backyard, take take camping with them, take take it on a hunting trip, you know, maybe when they go deer hunting, take it as a camp gun, um, you know, these kinds of things. You know, they buy it for general use to replace their uh, rimfire that they can't shoot in the city limits, but they can shoot mm-hmm. this in the city limits in most cases. And it's equal, if not even better, a better tool to do that job so you know it would be counterproductive to try and you know make make it what it's not you know yes what it is is 95 percent of what everybody wants anyway so you'd be trying to gain five percent and lose something on the other side so that's a great way to word that how he said like i was trying to make it what it wasn't and I took mm-hmm. it so far to get me to where I, I knew I could put on a good show for you guys on the hunt. <clears throat> but it, the, to Robert's point, that would be trying to make it kind of what it isn't. But it's not yeah, intended. You don't, you don't buy a pickup truck to go to go run races on Saturday night. Right. You know? And you yep. don't buy a Correct. sports car to haul groceries. So Very good way it. to put that. Yeah, yeah. perfect. Mm-hmm. So I got to ask, Steve. Yeah. Does it shoot slugs? Because everyone's going to ask. I couldn't get it to. Um, I tried everything. I tried all the all the weights. I tried all the brands. So my guess is it's either the twist straight or the mm-hmm. choke that's on that Lothar Walther Lothar Walther polygonal. But I also it might. I mean, I, I've had some. Ab- the gun will absolutely shoot slugs, but the barrels on those guns have not been designed to shoot slugs. Mm-hmm. Like like Steve said, it's two screws unscrew a barrel screw another one in and good to go you know it's all about the barrel technology the twist rate and the size slug that you're shooting and and all the rest you know so i would say yes the gun is absolutely capable of shooting slugs but maybe that the, the barrels that they're supplying remember it's in its in its nine out of ten form it's a semi-stroke full auto you know, pellets are generally a lot less expensive to shoot mm-hmm. and more accurate at anything inside of 100 yards in most cases than slugs are anyway. So, um, but, you know, LCS is working on slug barrels so that if somebody can buy just a barrel after they already own the gun, screw the barrel in and go on their, go on their merry way. Uh, shooting. You went right to my question, Robert. I was just going to ask that very question. <laughs> was there a path going forward to uh, to get slugs in this thing? And apparently, the answer to that is yes. That's, that's well, a- ab- yeah. absolutely. The you know the the issue that uh, that all air gun manufacturers have is you know barrels. You know you've got customer A that wants to shoot a light slug. Well. Okay, and you've got customer B that wants to shoot something heavy and a different design. Well, mm-hmm. you know, it, one <laughs> one barrel, one twist rate, one profile is not going to accomplish all things to all people. Well, the manufacturer can't order, you know, X amount of barrels to get a decent price and then, and then have all these different flavors of, of, of barrels and make sure that there's still a good quality, rigid, proper diameter barrel. You know, yeah. I mean, you want something that's going to yeah. hold up. Uh, you know, you don't want to go cheap on a barrel. You, you know, that's a lot of the heartbeat of the gun is is the barrel, especially whenever you're talking semi-auto where there's more vibration. Harmonics are coming at the barrel very, very fast. The barrel doesn't. It's have the time. last thing that touches your pellet. <laughs> yeah, the barrel doesn't have time to to untune it, to unvibrate. You know, with a semi-auto or a full auto. Yeah. So you need you got to have the rigidity, sure. to you know to be able to stand that. Uh, but yes, 
the, the short answer is yes, it's being worked on. Uh, I, I think a lot of the manufacturers across the board are working on it, but it's a laborious process to do correctly. You know, oh, you sure. don't just want to bring something and say it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, this shoots slugs. Yeah, it might shoot one slug. Good. Mm -hmm. You know, but you know that may be a slug that that not everybody wants to shoot, or you can't get a, a decent supply of. You know, uh, ammunition is a is an issue. Getting getting good ammunition is a is an issue. Getting enough good ammunition is an even more difficult issue that uh, mm -hmm. that we deal with. And whenever you think you have a good ammunition, next time you order it, it's not good anymore. <laughs> so you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so um, just, unfortunately, it's just um, you know, and you can't build a, you can't chase that because you'll be chasing. It's 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 something that will never stop. So yeah. either uh, you have to make a, a good choice and then run with that choice, and and hopefully uh, you know that it satisfies everyone's needs most of the time because you're never oh, going you, to satisfy got... everyone all the time. You've got jerks like me and Ted Beer out there that when we find a pellet that actually works in a particular gun, we go out and buy one or two sleeves of them at a time, you know, and it, we're definitely contributing to that scarcity well, in but, that market space. But, you know, it's so, like you said, it's so important that even when you find a pellet that you like or a slug that you like, and you, you go to reorder it again three months later, and now it's out of a different lot. That's and correct. You don't quite get that same performance, yeah. and you're like, oh, I don't want to get burned yeah. by that again. So I'm going to buy, I'm going to buy everything you have, and then. Well, we 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 frust we we deal with this, this frustration on a daily basis. I can tell you, my repair staff that are doing custom tunes for a lot of the competition shooters. You know, uh, there was a time where, uh, you know, and I'm not going to name names, but a specific 22 pellet that was heavy shot extremely well, uh, and. Uh, and now they don't, you know. So people are trying to re trying to find what they had a year ago uh, by, you know, maybe polishing their barrel or rebarreling their gun or going to, you know, all manner of gyrations to try and achieve what they had. Whenever all they need to do is go find an old tin of pellets that they had and, and shoot it, and it's, you know, it goes from shooting at, you know, literally three quarter of an inch at 50 yards to a quarter of an inch at 50 yards where it's almost like well this is simple to shoot you know i was really <laughs> working i was really working at trying to get this thing to group you know with this tin of pellets but with this tin of pellets i can close my eyes and pull the trigger you know mm -hmm. and uh that's just the world that we live in with you know with the limited manufacturers that we have and uh you know those magical dyes wear out or you know, manufacturer A complains that they need the pellet to have a little bit deeper skirt or or thinner skirt, or enough people complain that maybe the pellets are getting damaged, so the manufacturer gets tired of hearing that the pellets are getting damaged, so they make the skirt thicker. <laughs> One other thing shoots like hell because, you know, it changes the, uh, the center of pressure and it changes the dynamics of the pellet. Well, yeah, they got what they asked for. They, they have a pellet tin that doesn't, that there's no damaged pellets, but now they don't shoot good. So, you know, um, in that it's, it's basically wash, rinse, and repeat, you know, that process just happens over and over again. So you buying two sleeves of pellets and an LCS will last you about an afternoon, though. You know? I mean, <laughs> it does. Yeah. And Bill, and, uh, Bill and Patrick, <clears throat> I grabbed the, uh, the manual here, and it does, to Robert's point, it looks like they've, they've built this barrel around. It references the JSB 25 grain and the JSB 34 grain. So it's no surprise that it, you know, that performed well with that 34 mm -hmm. grain. Sure. Mm -hmm. And the only other thing I wanted to add <clears throat> is I was able to get the gun to run with all those different slugs. You'd have to seat them a little bit, manually seat them a little bit deeper into the magazine, which is made of titanium, by the way, to get it to hold onto those slugs. <clears throat> but um, it ran them. So, you know, you know why it's made out of titanium? Yeah. Oh, no, why? I didn't know why. Oh, yes, I have an idea, but but I'm not going to try to guess. Well, you you probably, well, if you have an idea, what's your idea? Inertia. <laughs> inertia. Yeah, yeah, inertia. That was a good one, Bill. Thank I think you. Bill, I think Bill's right. 
There's yeah. a reason I'm a geek. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the timing to make this thing clockwork properly, and I think Bill's dead on. I think it's an important deal. Well, it is. Well, I have those two ceiling surfaces on each side. It has to be machined right and perfect. There's a lot going on there. Mm-hmm. Well, you you know you need the bank that needs to be light so that uh, so that it'll spin with the least amount of uh, air pressure, you know, to make it spin. Yeah. So you know that uh, that's an important feature. You know, down this bunny trail, I just thought of something that I wanted to add for for the audience is you know there's different terms for this uh, lock time, shot cycle, dwell time. It's slower on this gun. It's, it's not too unsimilar to shooting like a Springer. So you really have to do your part. Like when I first got it, I was like, man, this thing sucks at 50 yards. But it, was, it wasn't it was that. It's that I hadn't learned. It was Steve sucks at 50 yards. It was Steve sucks because it's, it's a different type of deal, you know. Right. And you got to follow it, through it, with the gun a little it's bit. It's follow through. It's hold. Follow it's through. grip. It's cheek mm-hmm. pressure. It's... it's um, you know, the trigger is, it's not a match grade trigger. It's a good two stage with a little bit of a rolling second snap, mm-hmm. you know, and it's, it's kind of a heavier deal too. So you really got to do your part that it's like to Robert's point, the, the, the inherent accuracy is there, but you're going to have to bring your a game as an air gunner. If you want to try to make this into some sort of match gun at 50 and a hundred mm-hmm. for a hunter, it's going to be great. But if you try I, to push, I find all I find all bull pups, and I've been doing a lot of testing, a lot recently on different prototype guns and things, and I, I just find all bull pups to be much more difficult for me to shoot at a real high level than uh, than a rifle. Uh, mm-hmm. I think it's something about maybe the you know the the center of the recoil of the gun and where that is and how much you know, more <clears throat> movement there is depending on where that recoil center is. Uh, whereas a barrel out in front of me, I can control that more. Mm. Uh, you know, I get more rearward pulse recoil mm. than I do the gun turning mm. on its own center, which a bullpup kind of does. So Yeah, I get what you're saying. That lateral grip and that, that pull down kind of well, because everything your face and everything important. is in the middle of the barrel or close to the middle of the barrel mm-hmm. and all those pressures that you impart uh, on the gun whenever the gun goes off you're going to torque the gun in a manner that you're not going to torque a, a, a rifle so mm-hmm. and, and other people have other experiences other people you know shoot fantastic with them and they do better but but for me for a competitive gun uh, you know if I'm trying to shoot the best I possibly can a rifle just seems to hang out there the weight's out there in front, mm. and it just moves a little bit. I can follow the pellet down the mm-hmm. target. You know, I can see the pellet fly and, and, and all the rest. So, you know, I just think bullpups, in my opinion, bullpups in general, I don't care what brand, what make, what style, are a little bit more challenging to shoot. Hmm. I, I, um, with, with the SK in, in, ter- in regards to torque, when you're firing it, Every time I shot that gun, except for once, um, I had it on an AccuTac bipod and then set up on a bag on the back. And the gun itself is is wonderfully rigid. Like the frame is really rigid. So I, I wasn't really feeling that. And that AccuTac was really planting it. So it's actually a great bench slash prairie slash bed, you know, truck bed type of, it's a really good gun for that. So if that's the type of shooting that you do, uh, it's, it's it, it, I think it's going to appeal to a lot of people. Well, you get a lot, a lot of power in a short little package with it, for sure. Mm, and yeah. that's bullpups in general, so, anyway. So I got to ask, is it okay for lefties? <laughs> um, I, mean, I don't, wrong think, I don't think it matters other than the safety placement. Which I hated, by the way. <laughs> I, haven't Sorry, heard any complaints. I haven't heard any complaints by left-handed shooters. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it would matter because there's nothing for you to manipulate, Patrick. Okay. Just move your earplug over from your right ear to your left ear, and you're good to earplug. go. Yeah, there's a lot of hear. noise that comes out of that. There's not a whole lot that comes out of the business end. It's uh-huh. all kind of right here, and it's a tactile clack-clack. 
you know, uh, like right here. So you want to wear protection on that side. Um, the moderator definitely quieted it. The zero dB definitely took some bark out of it, but it wasn't like what you, what I would experience with a normal sixty foot pound air gun where it's all up on the muzzle end. It's mm, it's mm, it's almost like that, that that mechanism. It's almost like it it muffles it. It mutes the report quite a bit down down at the the uh, muzzle end, but over here by the ear, you get you can hear that m mechanism coming through your jawbone. Okay. Yeah. Kind of like a stapler gun going off yeah. a little bit. Like a what? Like a stapler gun going off a little bit. Yeah, stapler. I don't know. I've never experienced that bit. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I did so like it sounds like, sound like a staple gun a little bit. Yeah, it's a clack. It reminds me of my AK, honestly. It's the same <laughs> clack clack for me as my AKs. It just sounds exactly like it. Yeah, good That's question. Cool. Yeah. No yeah. way you guys are out of questions. Well, you guys have handled like you went step to step to step. This has been like the easiest podcast. I'm like, oh, that's great. Yeah, keep check marks. Yeah, yeah. You know you've done your job. No, Patrick. it's not. Yeah. You've got two guys um, over here, Steve and myself, that like to hear ourselves talk. So you know. Um, well, that's that's what makes a good podcast host. We uh, we throw some tiblets out there, and you guys eat them all up and run with them. I'm like, we just, God, we just run eat away all like our a questions. freight train. That's how you know you've done a great job as a podcast host, guys. When, when, when yeah. your your guests just get diarrhea of the mouth and can't stop. <laughs> I just throw a little piece of food over. But like the big things that that I was concerned was, you know, semi-auto being reliable. Yes, mm -hmm. that's come a long way. Check. Warranty three years. That's Check. that they stand behind it. Yeah. Um, dependability, uh, size, weight. I mean, um, pellet fussy. It's really not. You just need to know what it likes, and that's and they tell you. There's no it guessing. It is. I ran everything through this thing, all the 25. It it, it likes. And it's you, a one. You literally trip have everything. I I have a, most yeah. of everything, <laughs> and it this barrel was the these guys at LCS or Robert whoever was pulling the strings over there, they've designed this gun to shoot around the JSB 25 and 34 grain. Yeah. Yeah. That's In 25 color. cal. I don't know about the 22. Unless it says here. Let me see. Uh, yeah, 22, 25, and 30. Everything here references the JSB pellets. So um, I, I got it, it shot kind of okay at 25 yards with the Barracuda um, Hunter Extremes. Mm -hmm. I was getting nickelers at 25, probably hold together at 30, 35, but all the Barracuda variants, the Barracuda itself, the Barracuda Hunter didn't really the uh the poly mag it didn't care for the hornet it by h and n it didn't care for um but man it, it likes that jsb food yeah well it, a lot of them do you know well that's got to yeah. do with the uh, the lead in you know the lead in of the barrel is designed and the uh included angle of the uh of the mm -hmm. lands and the, the rifling you know have, have been designed for that pellet you know whenever you've got a pellet like the uh you know, like the Hornet that has a sharp, kind of a driving band as a head. You know, the the lead end of the barrel's not uh, not been des designed for that. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to remember. It's basically I, I like may, the... I may have misspoke, Patrick, um, on the on the Hornet and the in the Poly Mag. I don't honestly remember. Go back to my Instagram. You'll see if I had it on the table sure. and if it worked. <laughs> but um, I know everything else fit in there. Yeah, because it's a unique situation. It's it's a lot like the leshy. It's leaving the clip, and then it's going into the barrel. It's not being pushed into the barrel like nine out of ten other air guns. With and a then having air behind it with a yeah. revolver. It's yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a revolver situation, and that's revolver. very very precise. Mm -hmm. And to be able to go without ripping the skirt off, which I've heard has happened in the past when they started doing this type of style. It would just rip the skirt off, and now you just got a head coming out. Um, is remarkable. It oh, is. The yeah. magazine was actually rifled. When you look into the mm -hmm. that titanium it magazine, where it holds each pellet or slug, it's actually rifling in there that bites into. Really? The, yeah, you can see <laughs> oh, it. And yeah. I, I would actually push a pellet in there, and then go around the front side and push it back out with like a, you know, a little screwdriver or pin tip or whatever to see what it looked like. And it's it's leaving marks on that 
more marks, mm. I would say, than what you would see a, a polygonal barrel leave on there. So I'm not sure about how all that tech works, but it was just that's, an observation. That, that's to uh, make sure that the pellet stays in place when you load it. Gives, a, gives you a little bit more uh, friction on that pellet when you push it into the, to the magazine. You just reminded me of something I wanted to share with you, Robert, because you were talking about it earlier with the pellet manufacturing being what it is the last couple of years and dyes and us dealing with all the craziness in the world right now. But um, the um, that titanium magazine is so precisely made, yeah. it's almost like a pellet gauge. So I'd have like a tin of JSBs or a or the tin of the day states, which are made by JSB, or a tin of the FXs, mm -hmm. which are made by JSB, whoever it was. And you know when you've got a bad, a, a small head size, because you'll push it in tight, 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 and then you'll get a pellet that wants to just like fall in and Why fall right out of it. And then it's so you can all you can you can kind of cull your bad pellets with that, with that titanium That's mag. A very expensive yeah. part of that gun. It is. It very, was very, very interesting. Very well made. It reminds me of a turbocharger. I mean, in a way, you know, the the the, the veins on a bearing and a turbocharger. It's it's mm -hmm. everything has to be perfectly balanced. It's uh, you know, it's 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 almost aircraft grade type of precision. That it felt on. like it. There was only one rule, if I remember, and that's don't shoot it below 150 bar because that you might not get the clocking out of it that you're supposed to. I did it, and I didn't. I didn't have any issues. Well, you can. You know, you can. But you know, we we try and make sure that we p give ourselves a little bit of margin for error there because you know, if you tell people don't shoot below 150, they're going to try 140, and then sure. they're going to try 130, and then they're they're going to keep trying until the you know it doesn't work anymore. And air gun gauges <laughs> suck too. Why is it they're as an right. animal we human beings always have to go find out where the edge of that envelope is? We're uh, never gonna, happy with we're never happy with hearing the limit is right here. Well, I what don't happens know. if I go past yeah. that? And air gunners, Bill, I, have that even I, worse I, than I, the typical I, human being. It causes yeah. me so yeah. so much grief. <laughs> it drives me insane. I, I, <laughs> I'll tell you a quick story. We had a and this is this is not an outlier. This story. Um, <laughs> I had a gentleman that we sold a uh, a very high end rifle to uh, years ago. I think it was a Day State CRX. I think you know back you know twenty years ago that was a top level gun and it still can compete at the highest level. You know very very well made. Great barrel, great trigger, massive trigger. The trigger is the size of a reach block of most air guns now. But um, so this gentleman got uh, got the gun, and and he somehow got my cell phone number, and I, I don't know how. I have no <laughs> idea. And he was uh, yeah, in so uh, in Hawaii, right? So you know, my phone rings at two in the morning, and my when my phone rings at two in the morning, I'm thinking, Somebody okay, the alarm's be dead. Going the alarm's going off at the or or we've got somebody hurt, you know, my mom and my dad, you know, something's happening. You know, it's it's not a good thing when the when the phone rings at two in the morning. And I pick it up and the guy said, Hey, is this Robert? I go, Yeah, you know, I'm still waking yeah. up. Wrong number. But this is this I won't I won't repeat his name. This is <laughs> this is such and such. And I go, Oh, okay. And this is back whenever I used to do a lot of the tuning in my home and I mean this is in the early days. And uh, he said, uh, my, uh, my gun doesn't work. What, 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 are you, what are you talking about? It's two, 2 in the morning. What, your gun doesn't work. He said, yeah, I just got the rifle, and it doesn't work. I said, well, well, tell me what happened. He said, well, I got the gun, and I took it apart to see how it works. Now I can't get it back together. I said, did you, did you shoot the you, you, you took it apart. Uh, we all do that. Yeah, did you ever shoot? How, what happened when it was shooting? Oh, I never shot it. I just got it and took it apart. And that, We're and all air gun detectives. We all do that, Robert. What's wrong yeah. with people? Why can't they I buy it and just use it and have fun with it? Not everyone is an air gun technician. <laughs> we all, yeah, but we all try to be. Why? I think why, that's the Lord, part why? of the fun of being an air gunner. Why? <laughs> you know, I don't claim to be a, you know, a rocket engineer or I'm not going to go and try and build a block wall. I can neither, I can neither confirm or deny.
We Never are all tinkerers. That. We're master tinkerers, Patrick. <laughs> Bill, I think you would. What's you this part? Validate yeah. that. Too. It's the part oh, yeah. that does what it's supposed to do when you pull the trigger. Go shoot your gun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Bill, Bill sits so still. I can't tell if he's buffering, and I just watch to see if his <laughs> if his eyes blink. <laughs> it's it. I'll tell you what. I I hunt a lot of rats. And wow. if you if you get, if you get used to that, you learn to stay remarkably still because they really have terrible vision, but they respond quickly to motion. So if you can stay perfectly still, they will walk right past you. Wow! And, They're like uh, T Rex. They're sites yeah. based on motion. Yeah, absolutely. Crazy. You reminded me, Bill, of a, I learned something about iguanas last week that I wanted to share with the audience. In and you'll see me in the video like like this all the time and they they if you wear sunglasses you know they they look they're look they're like looking at you you know like up above the grass <laughs> and stuff and as long as you got your sunglasses on you're good but as soon as you do this if once they can see your eyes there's something that triggers their evolutionary response mm -hmm. and they can see well 50 60 yards as soon as they see your eyes they get all freaky and paranoid and they're ready to yep. like they're ready to bolt, and Jessica taught me that earlier on. You know, you leave your sunglasses on like as long as possible. But um, there's something about when they see your eyeballs, man, they get really. Well, your really eyes are scared. forward facing. You're a predator, right? So they see. Yeah, you. I, yeah, yeah. I guess. I man. wonder how those glasses with the like googly eyes on the springs. I wonder <laughs> how they would work if that would really <laughs> off. probably confuse the hell out of them. <laughs> Either that or you'll get asked to leave whatever your permission you're on. Oh, I'm probably mm -hmm. going to get asked to leave anyway. But. <laughs> there were some people at the park like, what in the heck? Because, you know, we're walking around with sure. what look like AK-47s oh. and AR-15s, yeah. like plug-in yeah. lizards. You know, you can buy these things in yeah. a pet store. And some mm -hmm. of these people were just like, you know, there's people fishing around there. And they're just like, what in the heck are you guys doing? And you'd have to stop occasionally and explain oh. to people that you know we're there on behalf of the county and the park, and this is the problem, and you know we're gonna solve the problem and save the owls. If I tried to do that in California, I would probably get a bunch of hippies and surrounding me trying to do a prayer, you know, circle or something. Save, save the rats. Me. Yeah, to save me. <laughs> save, the save the rats. <laughs> yeah. Save the rats. I've got a rat story, Bill. My family and I went, to, this is, I don't know, this is a ways back, maybe seven or eight years ago, we went to uh, San Francisco. My boy was, my youngest boy, he was about uh, 10 or 12 at the time, we took a friend and my wife, and we went to San Francisco, and you know, the kids wanted to go to Chinatown, okay? So we went to Chinatown, and you know, had fun there walking around, and you know, just buying stuff that they have in the store, and you know, the kids are just having a blast, you know, 20 bucks bought a basket full of stuff for them, you know. So then they wanted to go to Japanese town, which wasn't, if I remember correctly, it wasn't too far away. So we thought, well, we'll just walk over there, right? So we went to Japanese town, and it wasn't as big or, or as, as many shops and stuff as it was in Chinatown. And, and I really like San Francisco, to be honest. I, I love the food, the, you know, I love the ocean there and the museums and all the rest. I really enjoy myself. Uh, you know, the especially, show you all the especially the food, you know. Right here, Skomas is a great place to go eat. I just love it. And then we took another so one anyway, right here, we just kind of left yeah. Japanese town. We're walking down the sidewalk, and and we come to a, a light, and we're going to stop at the light to wait for it to change to cross yeah, the crosswalk. Still, and I look down, uh, and there's a rat <laughs> the size of a chihuahua a cat. I mean, I've never seen he, he, I've never seen a rat so big before. Okay, and he was alive, and people were just walking around paying him no mind, and this rat was there waiting for the light with the rest of us to cross the street. And I kid you not, no one raised an eyebrow or cared. I'm probably just used to him there. I mean, it was incredible. This this rat just oh, waiting there, yeah. get across the street with the rest of Along with the rest of the street. Street. Had nothing to fear because nobody <laughs> ever minded uh, Nobody kicked him or nothing. I mean, he was huge. I'd be afraid he would, you know, take my toe off or something. Wow. <laughs> like one of those wombats from... He was the size of oh, a yeah. nutria. You know a nutria is big, right? You've seen the... A nutria, yeah. It's like nutria yeah. big. 
I mean, his tail was was massive. I mean, his tail was like that big around at the base. Gross, man. You got got to wonder what they're eating there to get that big. Maybe it was somebody's pet, or somebody was fattening him up to put him on a (laughs) dinner table or something. I think he had eaten some poison, maybe. I mean, because he was a little out of sorts, you know. Maybe they. So you know, he was he was above ground, and maybe (laughs) he was high as a kite or something. He didn't know where. That it, cyanide hadn't kicked in yet. Yeah, well, I mean, Fully. wow, something else. Gross. It was. We'll call him George. George. <laughs> What's up, George? It was an experience. That's crazy. Yeah. Well, Have you guys got any more questions on the SK19? I feel like I've, I've become one with this thing over the last two weeks. I've got so much I've learned to share, and I feel like we're just barely scratching the surface. The only question I have is, when is one going to come to Ohio? That's my question. Well, other than that, I think we've dug into it really, really well. I'm I'm, excited. I'm sure there's people in Ohio right now that have loads of them. I don't think that's what he meant. That's not. I know that. I know that. I think. I think. I think Patrick was getting political on you, Robert. Very political. Like, no, no, I'm all good. You know, Um, each company has its own specialty, and each company has to survive and grow in its own way. Sure. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's so, a that's a great way to put that. Everyone's you know, got a family to take care of. And we've got we've got Dennis Baker, uh, at, didn't he in Ohio? And Baker Ergens in Ohio. Oh, yeah. Give him He's a call. He'll sell you, give give Dennis a call. He'll sell you one, no problem. I will see him the fourth of June, and so will Bill, because we I have a table at the yeah. Midwestern Air Gun Show here in it's Grove City is where it's at, Grove City, Ohio. Oh, okay. So, was there yeah. is there another um, air gun show that was fairly recent? I mean that the I, I was at Dennis Baker's place uh, two months ago, I think it was, and they were kind of him and Chad Kettner were kind of getting ready to to go to a show. That's this one. Is that is this, this this one? This is the biggest one on this side of the United States, short oh. of Texas. Okay, I know Chad uh, bought a bunch of collectible stuff off of us here recently to. Mm-hmm that he thought he could go take to the show and you know maybe um you know maybe find some interested parties there but yeah there's a lot of been with the pad van he says it's a real nice event i've you know i've never never been i I would like to go but it's it's if it's always on that fourth of july time we're we're usually up at our up at a summer home playing golf or something you know taking advantage of of that but uh i'd like to go i i understand it's successful and i've heard nothing but really good uh, feedback from it i think this is the fourth or fifth year last year was the first year that the uh, air gun geeks were there and even with COVID, it was packed and this year they got a lot of people coming uh and we were all told get ready and hotels are sold out so wow <laughs> that's always so, a good thing so, so, so a question for you, patrick is it a show that is predominantly guys bringing their own personal goods to to sell and talk and you know kind of kind of have a have like an air gun weekend you know or is it more corporate to where companies come and set up and and sell or is it somewhere in between the two which because the one in place it's a mixture the, yeah. a mixture the one in placerville was it's definitely definitely more along the lines of end users coming and you know showing off their that, at least that's the impression that I got yeah. So, yeah, you have a lot of old timers that have old school stuff from way back when, all the way up to the modern day state, Brocock, LCS, all the new stuff. I mean, you got Baker, Baker Air Guns is there. They're obviously the main people. Um, Target Forge will be there. Oh, Target Forge. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, but it's a, it's a lot of, you know, end, end users, if you would, air gunners. They bring their stuff. It's like a... I would call it like a, a gun show, a firearms gun show kind right. of situation. You got a mixture of everything. Bill, I, I've got a question for you. Whenever we, we've done a few in the early days, we did some gun shows. You know, the uh, you know Phoenix is famous for its gun shows. We've got some big ones, but but we never really were able to get any kind of traction. Oh, left handed. Uh, maybe we could now more so, that but I was still like, man, I that's a lot of time running. and effort and money spent. Uh, and it was always a negative cash flow deal for me. You know, I, I never left. I don't think I've ever been to a gun show where we left with more money than we than we spent. 
mm-hmm. you know. Uh, how do you find those? Is it maybe a product, you know, with Target Forge, does, since you're mainly targets, does it I, do you, do you I, turn, turn it up to make it work? I think what's unique about my product in that in them. that space, in that huh. event, Where's is that, that it's relatively market. inexpensive, mm-hmm. and people have that twenty dollars in their wallet that's burning a hole, and and they want to and they want to come home with something cool from the show, and I you know, this year at the Pacific Air Gun Expo, I had actually planned to launch Target Forge two years ago at that show. Not because I thought it was with leverage my brand at all, but because, you know, that's kind of where I formulated the idea was being there the year before. And I I was really absolutely blown away at the response that I got that Saturday at the Pacific Air Gun Expo. I, I actually tripled my money on that trip um, just with the sales from the table. And, you know, I... I, wow. I was what really blew me away. And if I'm honest here and I can bandstand for a minute on the Damn. Target Forge brand, um, the when I put the display up of the T poster, the unit that holds the clip that holds the uh conduit to the T post that allows you to put a target anywhere really quick and really easy, that absolutely blew up. I mean, I, I sold so many of those at that show. And, uh, you know, it, it's it's hard to get that image across to the customer online, right? I mean, they can see it. They can, you can tell them what it does. But when they come and they see it with their own eyes and they're like, holy crap, that would be so much fun to shoot. And I could dump pellets into that all day. That's where I, that's where my hook happened. And I, I um, you know, I think if, if you know, I don't think you're going to be successful at a show like that, bringing a bunch of three thousand dollar air rifles on the yeah. tape. I just that's don't think I, that's that's not the market for that. No, that's that's what I was just thinking, Bill. You have the perfect, mm-hmm. perfect emotional response show knickknack, where yeah. you know where everyone's going to want to take one home. You know when they see it because they can all relate to it. You know how they uh, use it. And but but an air gun is like it's like buying a quarter of a million dollar RV. You know, you go to a show to learn about it and become aware about it and go, holy yeah. shit, this is an air gun today. Then you go home, mm-hmm. then you research it. Yeah. Then you get on YouTube, you start just YouTube for a few hours, click, 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 click. Yeah, click. learn all about it, and then you make that educated purchase Absolutely. because that air gets up awful thin up around fifteen hundred bucks, two grand, twenty five hundred sure. bucks for an air gun. Sure it does. So mm-hmm. they they want to do their due diligence. You know, yeah, it's not an emotional purchase, is it? No, no, it's not it's an impulse not, purchase. It's not that's, an impulse. It's, it's not an impulse buy. Where, you know, yeah. um, like you said, I think that's a good comment. A twenty dollars target. I will also add to that, Robert. I think that if you were to go to a show like that and you had a ton of of really good swag uh that was air guns of arizona t-shirts jackets you know stuff like branded items like that mm-hmm. you could definitely clean house with that stuff and again it's right in that sweet spot um mm-hmm. i'm going to burn a 20 buck 20 dollar bill at this table and and get a t-shirt and hit the bricks you know that kind of stuff does move and if you could see, if you had a crew that was mobile, that didn't cost. Well, we do money. have a we do have a crew that's mobile, as you know, and we've got a. Yeah. But yeah. I think it's when it's it's July the fourth. June fourth. June fourth. It's June fourth. Yeah. Correct. I think, I think Larry is going to have the van at the uh, Tech Stream, so you know there's no way he can be at two places at at one mm-hmm. time. Uh, yeah, e- yeah, Elon Musk will fix that for you soon enough. <laughs> yeah, our hero go elon yeah go elon yeah. Woo! he just needs to but, buy um, youtube too and then i'll be like a <laughs> be like a mosquito yeah. in a nudist colony oh my gosh yeah Woo! well did he uh you know kind of changing direction did uh did the sale of twitter go through for him i know he was i'd heard yeah. that, uh, yeah, yeah. he owns it he's the, the big shot there. much or he's something because... he's he's making cultural changes as we speak well, it's about time, yep. you know. It really yep. is. It's about yep. time that us gun lovers have a place to talk. 
<clears throat> yeah. That that yeah. pendulum was due for a swing back the other way. <laughs> yeah. Freedom yeah. freedom of speech and the ability to exchange ideas freely without censorship yep. is um has been a big part of what's made our country great in this direction. Sure. It's gone where <clears throat> you know people are trying to quiet you know the messages that are out there whether they're right mm -hmm. or wrong or, or truthful or not on both sides it's just important that all that information be shared mm -hmm. so that people can make an informed decision for themselves you better agree yeah agree. but but well, are we are we talking air guns and sk19s here i feel like <laughs> we hopped down the wrong bunny trail and my audience is <laughs> going to be like what the <laughs> hell are you guys talking about <laughs> well i brought up so, the, the show question it's uh well i hope you uh are Super successful. Uh, Me too. Going because it's a big, you know, that's a big trip for you. That's a long ways. It. And, uh, yeah, I, I was shocked he was coming out, so I get to pick him up. I get to take him back to the airport and spend time with him and breakfast and show him my end. And this would be the first time I meet Bill in person. He's been a staple of the Airgun Geeks podcast. Uh, we started January of last year. He came into our lives in March. And has been a mentor, a friend, uh, a, a shoulder to cry on at times because, you know, this isn't easy. Um, we get a lot of good emails and we get some very mean ones. What, so, would, be your, what would be your mean ones? Uh, why would you get mean emails? Like, why are you killing animals? Why are you creating these oh. torture devices and promoting that? You know, I'll get something about the iguanas. You know, because I talk about the varmint business, and they're like, "Why would you that's do just, that?" That's you know? just part. Of, that's just part of it. It's all part of it. It's all part of it. Yeah. Hey, for my for my audience that hasn't so seen you before, how can mm -hmm. they find you, Patrick? If they want to listen to your Airgun Geeks podcast and stumble across you on YouTube, where do they go? So we're we are on every type of platform you can find a podcast. Primarily, um, we're on uh, Amazon. We're on Spotify. We're on Apple Podcasts. Uh, you could even just go to airgungeeks.com and you'll see the list and it'll take it to whatever platform you normally use for podcasts. Mm -hmm. um, I am working on a website. I'm, I'm getting there. It's, it's a lot of work. And then um, YouTube, I partnered like with you, Steve. I get to see your people. Um, I'm, I've talked about doing video in the past. I'll be honest, guys. I just don't have time and running around and i also compete and getting the word out and whatnot so you'll see bill and i he's my field reporter we're going to meet at armac and i'll i'll probably see steve there too um and then if i could swing it because i do have a full-time job that i work nine to five uh, i'd love to go to ebr and experience because it's it's different people but it's all about money and time right now well then so. why, why why not just choose ebr now, 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 boys. Hey, Bill, if <laughs> well. I, we're gonna keep. We're gonna keep the family <laughs> friendly. Hey, All Bill, right. if Steve, my, if you my grab audience, one, I'll grab the other. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> hey, Bill, if my audience wants to find you, and and you're new to them, where do they go to do that? Well, the first place they should go is Target Forge on YouTube. Just put in Target Forge on YouTube, and you'll find my YouTube channel there. And uh, and give us a subscribe there while you're visiting, and also the business Target Forge is targetforge.net, and we we love to make people uh, to to bring our products to people to let them have the most fun they can have with a pellet. And what are your products, Bill? We make reactive targets and also easy easy setup targets that don't weigh a ton they don't take a lot of space in your vehicle they break down really quick they set up really quick it basically is just really nice home and club target equipment for the consumer and actually this friday i'm going to receive a shipment that is a new product for target mm -hmm. forge and it is range flags so they're really nice designed to be in the outdoor environment range flags in 10 yard increments so you can mark out your your range and have a have range markers that are portable they're cheap and uh, we think that's going to be a fun product too but and, and you're for oh sorry about no go ahead you're you're for powder burners and air guns alike no no all of our air stuff is, is in the air gun range i mean some of our stuff reaches up into 22 22 long rifle 
uh -huh. velocities and energy levels. That's fine. Uh -huh. But, you know, we, I, that's a huge industry. The, the firearms target companies are really big and, and really have a lot of marketing money. Uh, I saw the niche in the air gun world because finding quality, and I, I emphasize quality air gun targets uh, that are American made and durable in the environment is really a challenge. Um, so I, I thought I could I could fill that space, and it's been it's been a heck of a lot of fun. I know a lot of people speak um, very highly of you and your products, Bill. So mm -hmm. my audience, check them out. And and I know y'all know Air Guns of Arizona. They were one of my very first sponsors seven years ago. And, Happy and to be uh, you already. thank you. And uh, they right. they've been an, an enabler for me for a long time with a lot of product and precision air gun distribution too. So uh, thank you, Robert, for that. And um, thank you for the invite. I appreciate uh, the time that uh, you've been able to let me babble on. Yeah, this is cool. I like it because, <laughs> yeah. you know, the audience gets to know you. And, 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 and if you're hearing us on, on the Air Gun Geeks podcast for the first time, guys, I have two YouTube channels, AEAC Home, AEAC Vlog, all about air guns, reviews, uh, factory tours around the world, shooting coverage as far as events around the world. And uh, and now we're going to get into some pesting and some hunting too. So uh, the Air Gun Exploration and Advancement channel on YouTube, uh, AEAC Vlog, uh, Instagram Hooked on Air, Facebook Hooked on Air, and I have a website too, AEAConline.com, if you want to know what's in the bullpen, bullpen and the syllabus. So um, that's all I've got, Patrick, Bill, Robert. You guys have anything else for me? I, I just want to emphasize one more time that air the target forge targets we've beat them up. They're still working. I've got stuff that's out there. And if you want to help support the Air Gun Geeks podcast, you can use Super Geek Ten when ordering at Target Forge. Of course, check us out. I think we're going to have a special gift uh, at the show if you see us. So I just wanted to say that I want to thank everyone for their time. Uh, Robert, yourself, taking time on your busy schedule, and of course, all of your listeners and subscribers, Bill and and Steve, uh, I'm I'm very appreciative to be part of this group, this culture, and this family. So thank you, thank you, Patrick. I appreciate thank you having Patrick. me on. Bill, it's good to see you again, Steve. You thanks too, so Robert. Bill, good to see you. Take see you guys in a couple of weeks, and thanks again. Take care, all right. guys. All right. Bye -bye.